It's an honor to be invited. And uh, I especially appreciate uh, the fact that uh, we're the last speakers of the uh, program. And so uh, after this nice uh, final dinner, you'll pay special attention to hearing about the universe. Until very recently, no one had any idea what the universe was like. We had no data on distant galaxies. In fact, until very recently, we didn't even know the distance to very many stars. And thus, we had no way to test alternative theories. We didn't know the basic operating principles of the universe. And thus, we couldn't think scientifically about how we humans fit in. The joke among astronomers, or at least about astronomers, was that cosmology is the science where the ratio of theory to data is infinite. <laughs> Lots of theories, no data. But that's completely changed. Thanks to all of these new telescopes, the situation is now that there's only one theory left that fits the data. And that theory tells us that the universe is made mostly of dark matter and dark energy. In this talk and in our book, Nancy and I call this theory the double dark theory because it's based on dark matter and dark energy. The technical name is lambda CDM, lambda for the cosmological constant or dark energy and CDM for cold dark matter. This has now become the accepted standard model of modern cosmology. What is emerging is humanity's first picture of the universe as a whole that might actually be true. We may be in the midst of a cosmological revolution on the same scale of cultural significance as the Copernican revolution 400 and more years ago. The new cosmology explains far more than just the Big Bang. It provides an underpinning for a new global shared picture of reality. And that can possibly improve prospects for global cooperation. Now, most educated people today still picture the universe as a shapeless, possibly infinite, and mostly empty space, the same way that Isaac Newton pictured it in the 17th century. But at the same time, we are exploiting technologies based on relativity, quantum mechanics, genetic engineering, new science which is completely inconsistent with that picture of the universe. The major threats to human survival today, world environmental degradation, extinction of species, climate destabilization, nuclear war, terrorists with weapons of mass destruction, all result in large part from unrestrained use of modern technologies without an accurate cosmic context in which they make sense and from which we can get some perspective on what we're really doing with these things. Our home planet Earth is integrated into the cosmos, but our current thinking about it is not, and therein lies the root of many problems. In the year 1054, a new star suddenly appeared in the sky, and it burned so brightly it could be seen in the daytime. But no one in Europe recorded this extraordinary event. In the medieval cosmology of their time, Earth was the center of the universe, and the heavens were exactly the way that God had created them, eternally unchanging. So a new star was simply inconceivable. Today we know that a supernova appeared then. In fact, this is it, the Crab Nebula. We know this because Chinese and other astronomers recorded it. They were living in different cosmologies. In the same way, human beings only perceive threats that make sense in our cosmology, because our cosmology is our reality. Our modern technological society is exercising power, the long-term effects of which are as invisible to us as the 1054 supernova was to medieval Europe. A new perspective could make all the difference. In his acceptance speech on election night, President-elect Obama told the story of a 106-year-old voter named Ann Nixon Cooper, and he described the enormous panoply of historical changes that she had seen in her life. Let's watch that for a second. America, we have come so far. 
We have seen so much, but there's so much more to do. So tonight, let us ask ourselves, if our children should live to see the next century, if my daughters should be so lucky to live as long as Ann Nixon Cooper, what change will they see? What progress will we have made? This is our chance to answer that call. This is our moment. This is our time. I believe that the president-elect is laying down a challenge here to all of us to start thinking about what we could call the Malia-Sasha horizon. The Malia-Sasha horizon is not just an abstract hundred years. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the actual lifetimes of these two little girls. All their lives, Malia and Sasha are going to represent the interests and the emerging characteristics of today's elementary school generation. The year 2108 is an inescapably real time that will truly arrive for them, even though many adults today economically discount it as if it were some kind of low probability event. Expanding our thinking to truly consider the Malia-Sasha horizon would be a first step toward gaining a cosmological perspective. Now, there's a second way in which today's assumed picture of the universe discourages people from seeing the long-term consequences. In that Newtonian picture where space goes on immeasurably, no place is central or special, and so we humans just seem to be insignificant specks in a random location. So here we have mythologist Joseph Campbell who said, humanity is a scurf on the epidermis of a small planet of an average star. And Here's biologist Stephen Jay Gould, who says, humans are merely a fortuitous cosmic afterthought. In fact, the idea that we're insignificant specks is so common that here it is in peanuts. I don't know if you could read this. It says, you are of no importance. Did you know that? This is Lucy talking to Snoopy, for those of you in the back. You are only the tiniest speck in an enormous universe. And poor Snoopy sits there and tries to take that in and says, then I might as well go back to sleep. Here's the exact same thing in Calvin and Hobbes. So Hobbes, the tiger, says, what a clear night. Look at all the stars, millions of them. Calvin says, yes, we're just tiny specks on a planet particle hurling through the infinite blackness. And they try to take that in. Let's go in and turn on all the lights. <laughs> now, the new cosmological picture completely surprised those of us who assumed that we were insignificant specks because it turns out that intelligent beings are actually special or central to the universe in multiple profound ways. We, like all observers, are at the center of our visible universe. We're living at the midpoint of time in four different senses. Our bodies are midway between the largest and smallest possible sizes in the universe and we are made of the rarest material in the universe. Now, I'm not saying the Earth is geographically central. Of course, Galileo was right. But in even more ways than just these four, we are central to the fundamental principles that underlie the double dark universe. And this centrality could provide us with a meaningful and practical cosmic perspective on our planet and on ourselves. So now it's my job to help us get oriented in this new picture of the universe. Here we are on the third rock from the sun, the third of the four inner rocky planets. It takes light eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth, a few hours to cross the solar system. But it takes light 100,000 years to cross our galaxy. There's our solar system about halfway out in the galaxy. The galaxy in turn is just one of the points in this much larger scale picture of what we call the local supercluster, the nearest 10,000 or so galaxies. We're now going to take a trip starting from Earth across part of our galaxy and then up and out of the galaxy and across the Virgo cluster, across the local supercluster to the Virgo cluster. The Virgo cluster is the densest concentration of galaxies for 100 million light years around. 
we're going to start heading toward this familiar constellation, Orion. The Milky Way is this arc of light next to Orion. As we head toward the sword underneath the belt of Orion, it comes apart because it's made of stars and this big nebula, the great nebula in Orion, which is a gas cloud lit up by the young stars that have just formed in it. As we pass the Horsehead Nebula, we're now 1,500 light years from Earth. Here's another glowing gas cloud, the Rosette Nebula, another stellar nursery. We've actually mapped the distances to 100,000 nearby stars, and they're all put in the computer in their proper locations. This is another one of these nebulae, but this isn't a stellar birthplace, it was a stellar death place. This is that Crab Nebula that Nancy talked about, the 1054 explosion. Dust from explosions like this hides most of the galaxy from our view. So now we're going to rise up and out of the galaxy so that we can view the gorgeous panorama of our cosmic home. As the galaxy recedes into the distance with the large and small Magellanic clouds and other satellite galaxies, everything we see now is a galaxy. Coming into view now is the other big galaxy in our local group, the Great Galaxy in Andromeda, and the third smaller spiral galaxy, M33, the Triangulum Galaxy. As we pass through this glowing gas cloud in M33, we're now two million light years from home. Here are some pretty nearby galaxies. That was M81 and M82. You can see those very nicely with small telescopes. This is the Whirlpool Galaxy, M51. Now we're headed for the Virgo cluster over there, but we're taking a scenic route, as you may have noticed. Now, I hope you can see that there's a long chain of galaxies here, and we're entering the chain in a region called the Ursa Major Cluster, and now we're going to ride down that chain of galaxies into the Virgo Cluster. We've mainly seen disk galaxies up until now, but now we're starting to see elliptical galaxies, big balls of stars without a disk. And this voyage ends at M87, the gigantic elliptical galaxy at the center of the Virgo Cluster. It has a jet coming out of a black hole at the center, the black hole has a mass more than three billion times the mass of our sun. Well, that was just a little trip. Now we're going to take a really big trip. Our entire local supercluster is just the tip of this next V down. It's just the little region down there, where now, from here to here, is a billion light years. We've mapped a large number of galaxies, about a million so far. And this picture shows these galaxies mapped just in a few directions. These are the nearby reasonably bright galaxies out to a distance of two billion light years. Those are the little black region in the center of this bigger picture that shows galaxies now in red out to six billion light years. This picture is just the inside of this much bigger picture that shows the really bright quasars mapped out to a distance today of 28 billion light years. Now that may seem a little surprising since the entire universe is less than 14 billion years old. I'll come back to that. But let's first of all just see how these galaxies are distributed in space. So we're now backing away from this nearby part of the universe where we live. All of these galaxies have actually been mapped. Yeah. 
We're about a billion light years out now. That's two billion light years when the first of these red galaxies come in. Those represent the luminous red galaxies that are mapped out to a distance of six billion light years. Now, it's a bit hard to see what's going on because all of these galaxies pile up in front of each other. You can start to see the overall picture. You see large regions with almost no galaxies surrounded by walls of galaxies, cosmic voids we call them, and cosmic walls. But to get a really good sense of how the galaxies are distributed, it helps to rotate the image. So you can see that it's like slices through a sponge, these mapped regions of galaxies. The holes in the sponge are the cosmic voids. Now the quasars. And now, a view you can only see with the help of a computer visualization. We're looking at the Big Bang from the outside. This is the heat radiation of the Big Bang, represented in different colors. The differences are only a few millionths of a degree, but our latest instrument, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, allows us to map this very precisely. To encapsulate the theory or the understanding behind the universe, as Joel's just shown it, we need a symbol. And this is what Joel and I call the cosmic spheres of time. It represents the entire visible universe, but only from the point of view of time. Our galaxy is at the center. When we look through telescopes, we see the galaxies as they were when the light that's reaching us now left them, sometimes billions of years ago. Since light travels through space at a fixed speed, the light from farther away has been traveling much, for, much longer to get here. So when we look out into space, we look back in time. So these concentric spheres don't just represent space. Each sphere, as you move outward, represents an earlier and earlier epoch in the history of the universe, with the Big Bang represented by the outermost sphere. We are at the center of our past today. The past is not over. It's racing away from us at the speed of light, like ripples from a pebble thrown into a pond, but not in, sphere, in circles. It's moving out in spheres, spheres of time. The era when our sun and earth were forming four and a half billion years ago is still out there. We're receiving light from it today. Further out is the era when big galaxies on our, like our own were just starting to form. And beyond that, the most distant bright galaxies that we can see today. You may notice that those galaxies don't look anything like the nearby spiral and elliptical galaxies. Beyond that is a region where we don't see anything. We're going to be able to see a little bit further when the James Webb Space Telescope is launched in a few years because that will let us see in the infrared. But there's a great distance before galaxies become bright enough for even the biggest telescopes to see them. The cosmic dark ages. Beyond that is this very colorful sphere of the cosmic background radiation. And the outermost sphere is the Big Bang itself, the cosmic horizon, beyond which we cannot see even in principle. With telescopes, we see galaxies as they were millions and billions of years ago. But in the cosmic spheres of time, we're showing them where they are now, of course, much larger than the scale of the picture, so that you can actually see them. But we're showing you how they liked, how they looked when the light left them. Because of the finite speed of light, we can't see what they look like now, but we can calculate what they are now using the double dark theory. The Big Bang happened less than 14 billion years ago, but the distance out to the cosmic background radiation sphere is now about 46 billion light years. This is, of course, much farther than light could have traveled since the Big Bang. But the radiation that we see now left that matter a long time ago when the matter was much closer to us than it is now. It was only about 46 million light years away when the matter that radiated that Big Bang radiation uh, did, did that, when, the, when that matter radiated it. The universe has expanded by a factor of a thousand since then. 
And of course, the most distant galaxies and the matter that radiated the cosmic background radiation has been traveling away from us much faster than the speed of light. This is consistent with relativity. In fact, everything I'm saying is uh, based on general relativity, our standard modern theory of space, time, and gravity. Now, unlike that last video, which ended looking at the universe from the outside, if we want to get an accurate sense of how we intelligent beings fit into the universe, we have to start looking at it from the inside where we actually are. The cosmic spheres of time place us at the center, but it's still as if they're on the screen and we're out here looking at it. So in your imagination, jump into this picture. Take your place there at the center. And then close those spheres around yourself. And when you do this, you begin to start getting a sense of what it would be to have a place in the universe. We are immersed in the history of the universe. The place that we have in the modern universe is not going to be a geographical place. It's going to be a meaningful place created by the interaction of space, time, light, and consciousness. Because without consciousness, there's no visible universe. The cosmic spheres of time are real because the past is real. And evidence of this fact is arriving constantly from all over the universe. This is the deepest image of the universe that we have ever taken. It's the Hubble ultra deep field. It was taken by the advanced camera for surveys, which unfortunately stopped working over a year ago. We're hoping that after the astronauts visit Hubble for the fourth and final time and install two new instruments, they'll have time to repair the instrument that took this picture so that we can use it some more. The images that you saw in the cosmic series of time of the most distant galaxies were all taken from this ultra deep image. Now, this is the peak moment in the history of the universe for astronomical observation. It took billions of years of cosmic evolution to produce enough heavy elements to make planets like our own, and then billions of years of biological evolution on Earth before we came along with the technological ability to take pictures like that. But because the expansion of the universe is accelerating, the most distant galaxies are starting to disappear over the cosmic horizon. There will never again be so many galaxies visible. So that's the first way that we're living at a special moment. We're living near the transition from the universe slowing down its expansion to speeding up and having the galaxies start to disappear. Secondly, we're living close to the midpoint of the life of the sun and the earth. This picture shows the temperature, the, the heat radiation from the sun on the vertical axis and time in billions of years on the horizontal axis. And we're near the middle about four and a half billion years after the beginning, as I've said several times, and about five and a half billion years before the end. The sun is growing steadily warmer, like all stars of its kind, and it will turn into a red giant, swallowing the inner planets, and then ultimately it'll become a white dwarf. So we're living in the middle of the lifetime of a planetary system like our own. But we're living in a very special time for our planet. We're living in the middle of the best period for planet Earth, at least for big creatures like us. The large creatures on Earth first came into existence about half a billion years ago when Earth's atmosphere became enriched in oxygen thanks to microorganisms. The pleasant period of Earth will last perhaps another half a billion years before the increasing temperature of the sun evaporates all the water in all the lakes, rivers, and oceans, and then dissociates that water into hydrogen and oxygen at the top of the atmosphere, and the, and the hydrogen will be permanently lost. And so Earth will turn into a dune planet. Actually, this could be postponed for billions of years if our descendants can move Earth slowly away from the sun using large comets. Uh, my colleagues at the University of California recently figured out how to do that. Not, not practically, but in principle. 
But we have much more pressing problems right now. This is a pivotal moment for Earth because of this graph, which shows the increase in the numbers of humans on Earth. The number of humans has gone up by a factor of six in the last 200 years, a factor of four in just the last 100 years. That's never happened before. It will never happen again. Demographers disagree over the total carrying capacity of the Earth, but nobody thinks that we can have another couple of doublings. But, and, and fortunately, the growth rate of the human population actually peaked in the 70s, and it's been slowing down ever since. But the growth rate of our technology and our impact on the environment has continued to accelerate. The population's increased by a factor of six in the last 200 years, but the economy in constant dollars has increased by a factor of 100, which is probably a good thing. But our primary energy use has gone up by a factor of 30, and our carbon dioxide annual increase in carbon dioxide due to human activities has gone up by a factor of 20. And it's pretty clear that that can't go on much longer. There's going to have to be a radical change in the rate at which we're increasing our technological impact on the environment. We Americans have the greatest use of resources. This is a picture that we made based on the data from the Statistical Almanac of the United States. And it shows that the average American consumes his or her weight in resources every single day. Now, this is one of the graphs from the recent, the 2007 release of data from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of the United Nations. What it shows is data mostly taken from ice cores, from little trap bubbles of air, and what you see is that the carbon dioxide has fluctuated as the temperature has fluctuated. The gray periods are the interglacials. We're in one now, the warm periods. But at no point in the last 650,000 years has the carbon dioxide ever been higher than 300 parts per million. That's the carbon dioxide uh, level over there, except now. Today, the carbon dioxide has reached 380 parts per million, and it's increasing about five parts per million per year. The nitrogen oxide and methane are also, the other two main greenhouse gases, are also increasing rapidly. And since temperature has tracked carbon dioxide, we can be pretty sure that there's going to be a tremendous increase in global temperature as a result of this rapidly increasing carbon dioxide. This is a number of different scenarios. Three of them are marked. For the next 100 years, for the amount of carbon dioxide we'll put into the atmosphere each year. So, an optimistic scenario, B1, has us peaking around the middle of this century and then coming down. A less optimistic scenario has us peaking a bit later at a higher level and then coming down. And this scenario, A2, is basically business as usual, with the United States and China and other countries rapidly increasing the amount of carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere. The consequence in global warming is uncertain. The uncertainty bands are on the right. But we've had so far an increase, depending on where you start, of, of 0.6 or 0.8 degree Celsius. But these are increases, optimistically, of only two degrees from the present, or as much as four or more degrees, maybe a lot more. And if you look at what the consequences are projected to be across the Earth, the United States doesn't come off very well. This is, in about 20 years, this is the end of the century, the Malia-Sasha horizon, if you like. And these are temperature increases across the United States of typically about four degrees. And that's for 
this optimistic scenario. This is for the pessimistic scenario. And there you get temperature increases of eight degrees across the United States. So the question is, which will it be? Choices that are being made now are going to decide what we do over the next century. So we're at a pivotal point for the human species. Can we end the exponential growth in our impact on the environment? There's no law of physics that says we have to fail. It's a question of human choices. For the whole world to achieve sustainable prosperity in this age of electronics and information should not require profligate resource use. Putting together what we now know about how we fit into time on all these different size and time scales, our descendants could have at least hundreds of millions of years to live together on this jewel of a planet if we can just get through the next few decades without disaster. Not only are we at the center of the visible universe and the midpoint of time in all those senses, but we and our entire planet as I mentioned earlier, are made of the rarest material in the universe, which is stardust. And stardust is heavy elements that are spewed out by stars during a supernova. Stardust is one hundredth of one percent of the density of the universe. So what you're seeing here is the way that the universe looks to Hubble Space Telescope. And it's so beautiful, but it's very misleading because all it shows us is light. And all that light reveals is half of 1% of what's out there. It's been an enormous challenge to figure out what the universe was made of, but it turned out that that was the key, because each element has its own characteristics, and the way the universe works is determined by what it's made of. So now here, we're going to introduce a symbol for the universe as a whole, but this one is from the point of view of what is it made of. We call this the pyramid of all visible matter, and of course you'll recognize this. We borrowed it from the back of the dollar bill and the great seal of the United States. Here we're using this pyramid uh, the, where the volume of each section is proportional to the amount of that ingredient in the visible universe. And the ribbon at the bottom says in Latin, the new order of the ages, and that's what this new universe picture is going to become. Almost all the atoms in the entire universe are just the two lightest types, hydrogen and helium, almost all of which came out of the Big Bang. And the ratio of mass, roughly one part helium to three parts hydrogen. So that, that fills the entire bottom section of the pyramid. And the earliest stars are just made of that hydrogen and helium. But those stars are powered by nuclear processes that produce heavier elements. And those heavier elements are then spewed out at the ends of the lifetime of these stars, either fairly peacefully, as planetary nebulae, for example, or violently in supernovae. And it's those heavy elements that make up all the rest of the periodic table. That's the stardust. That's represented by the very small volume of the capstone of the pyramid. As Nancy said, the entire pyramid of all visible matter in the universe represents half of 1% of what's actually out there. What's the other 99.5%? Well, you'll notice that the pyramid is on the ground. What's underneath? There's this gigantic, invisible, cosmic density pyramid, which is supporting everything else. There's about 4% of invisible atoms, atoms that are not stars and are not lit up by stars out in between the galaxies. But the vast majority of the mass that's holding our galaxy and all the other galaxies together is not atoms and it's not made of the stuff that atoms are made of. It's not made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. It's something entirely different. We don't know what it is. We call it cold, dark matter, which describes how it behaves. It might be weakly interacting massive particles, WIMPs for short, which are possibly associated with a new kind of uh, symmetry of the universe called supersymmetry. And if so, we're very likely to start making the stuff 
when the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva turns back on and this time stays on for a while uh, next year. There are also very good prospects that we'll be able to see this stuff by other means over the next couple of years. There's ex an experiment that's just starting now in the United States DUSEL, Deep Underground Science and Engineering Laboratory, <coughs> the Homestead Gold Mine, the deepest mine in North America has been converted into this new laboratory and one of the first important experiments is an experiment which is three orders of magnitude more sensitive than any other experiment to date for detecting the dark matter. So this is the cosmic density pyramid. We've only known about the fact that most of the matter in the universe is dark matter for a couple of decades and it's only since 1998 that the evidence has become completely convincing that the majority of the density of the universe isn't any of the things I've mentioned so far. It's this giant bottom part of the pyramid, dark energy. We know even less about dark energy than about dark matter. And one of the great challenges for the next era in science, especially physics and astronomy, is to try to figure out what the dark energy is. I recently served on a National Academy study of what the most important priorities are for the next generation of uh, deep space probes. And our first priority is a joint dark energy mission. Joint because it's going to be the Department of Energy and NASA. And both NASA and the Department of Energy have announced that they are going to proceed to develop such a new kind of satellite, to do new kinds of measurements. So that's our picture of what the universe is made of. Well, a way to just visualize this is to uh, imagine that the entire universe is filled with an ocean of dark energy that powers the expansion of the universe. And on that ocean, there sail billions of ghostly ships made of dark matter. And at the tips of the tallest masts of only the largest, largest ships are little beacons of light. And when we look out into the universe, all we see are those beacons of light. We don't see the ships and we don't see the ocean, but we know they're there through theory, specifically this double dark theory. Now, especially if you haven't heard about this before, and even if you have, you must be thinking that this is a really crazy story that the universe is practically all invisible, made of very mysterious stuff. Why would anybody believe such a thing? Let me show you some of the evidence. This graph represents, on the vertical axis, something that we call power. And on the horizontal axis, size. This is angular size, 90 degrees, 2 degrees, half a degree. The graph, the, the blue curve, is something that was predicted by this double dark theory many years ago. And when the data from, first of all, the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite came in in 1992, uh, 1994 rather, it, it showed that this part was right. That was a prediction of a paper that my colleagues and I published in 1984. And then all of these white points came in starting in 2003. The data I'm showing here is from the latest data release earlier this year. And every single point is just where the theory predicted. This continues the graph down to even smaller angular scales with ground-based data. And you have to agree that the data is just where the theory predicted. Now, this shows that the double dark theory correctly accounts for the Big Bang. But it also correctly predicts the distribution of matter on every size scale that we can measure from smaller than galaxies to galaxies to clusters of galaxies to superclusters of galaxies all the way out to the cosmic horizon. The very same theory succeeds on both of those scales. Well, here's this drunk and he's sitting on the steps and he says to his friend, Quarks, neutrinos, mesons, all those damn particles you can't see, that's what drove me to drink. But now I can see them. And the reason this cartoon is actually true, at least for us, is that um, now we too can see what can't be seen. 
Um, we're going to show you one more video, and this one is different from the earlier ones. Um, the two earlier, earlier ones were actual observations from telescopes. Um, but this one is going to be of the dark matter. And since no light ever comes from dark matter, and we can only detect it through its gravitation, the only way we can see it is through these computer simulations. So uh, what the video does is it uses brightness to represent density. But when you're looking at it, just remember that what looks bright is really totally invisible. So before I show you the actual uh, visualization of one of our simulations, I'm going to add a few more uh, uh, explanations. So if we showed you how we think the universe really expands, we'd have to start with some region that's very small. It would get bigger and bigger, and finally it would get to be this size. But if we did that, you wouldn't be able to see the distribution of matter until it got to be fairly large. So instead, what we're going to do is blow all of these up to full size. And so what we're going to show is just how the distribution of matter changes as time goes on. We're going to show it in three dimensions. And the way we're going to do that is by rotating the image slowly. But of course, it doesn't rotate in reality. There's also going to be a clock counting down the billions of years since the Big Bang in the lower left corner. So here goes. The dark matter starts pretty smooth. But very quickly, it starts to clump into long filaments. And the bright regions, as Nancy showed, are not galaxies, but they're the dense regions of dark matter where galaxies form. You can see where the filaments cross. There's a place. Here's a place where filaments are crossing. That's where the clusters of galaxies form. And the superclusters are these long filaments that crisscross around the great clusters. The distribution of galaxies that's predicted by these kinds of simulations is in fabulously good agreement with how we measure the galaxies to be distributed, both in the nearby universe and also, if you look to the beginning of the simulation, that also correctly predicts how the galaxies are distributed farther away, another confirmation of the theory. Well, we're going to suggest one more way of symbolizing the universe as a whole. And this is not going to focus on time or ingredients, but on size, the meaning of size. This is what we call the cosmic Ouroboros. And an Ouroboros is a snake that swallows its tail. Uh, now, what we've done here is we've taken all of the possible sizes in the universe and arrayed them logarithmically around the serpent from the smallest size that physics allows at the tip of the tail getting larger and larger and larger until the largest size at the head is the cosmic horizon itself. It may not be the largest size, but it's the largest size we can say anything meaningful about. So let me just point out what we're, what we're looking at here. Um, smaller than the cosmic horizon, this is a supercluster of galaxies, a galaxy, the distance to the stars in uh, Orion, this is uh, the size of the solar system, the sun, the earth, a mountain, human beings, an ant, a single-celled creature, a strand of DNA, a single atom, the nucleus of an atom, and then some exotic particles, including possibly the dark matter itself. This is an almost unimaginably wide range of sizes, but it turns out that we humans are almost exactly in the middle. And we couldn't be anywhere else, because if we were much smaller, we wouldn't be made of enough atoms to have the complex kind of consciousness that we have. And if we were very much larger, the internal speed of communications, which is ultimately uh, limited by the speed of light, would be too slow for us to think. And the fact that we intelligent creatures, at least we humans, are here leads us to believe that possibly any intelligent life in the universe is limited by the same, uh, for the same reasons. And so intelligent aliens would probably also be somewhere in this range of sizes. Now, it turns out that different forces are important on different size scales. On really large size scales, the force that's controlling is gravity. On the size scales around our size, it's electrical and magnetic forces that are important. That's what gives rise to chemistry. 
On the size scale of the atomic nucleus, the additional forces that are called the weak and strong force play an important role. Now we have what we think is a very good theory of the weak, strong, and electromagnetic interactions. That's called the standard model of particle physics. But there's no room in the standard model of particle physics for dark matter, and dark matter is most of the mass in the universe. So we expect that the dark matter must be associated with still smaller size scales that are now uh, beginning to be probed, for example, of the Large Hadron Collider. The snake swallowing its tail symbolizes the hope that there'll be grand unification. The grand unified theory, gut, uh, is right there at the snake swallowing its tail. The best hope for a real unification of the forces that dominate on the small scales and gravity, which is the most important force on the big scales, is supersymmetry which is the idea behind superstrings. But unfortunately, we don't know how to make predictions yet from superstring theory. The main prediction is that we may discover supersymmetric particles, and maybe one of those particles will be the lightest supersymmetric particle, the dark matter WIMP. That remains to be seen, but what we can say so far is that size matters. Galileo was the first to appreciate that, at least from the physics point of view. Galileo drew these pictures in the book that he published when he was under house arrest uh, after the Vatican declared him uh, to have not followed the, the rules by declaring that the earth goes around the sun. So what Galileo pointed out is that the strength of a bone is proportional to its cross-sectional area. So if a bone, if a, an animal just scales up in all dimensions by a factor of say three, the cross-sectional area of its bones will increase by a factor of three squared, or nine. But its mass will increase by its volume, which goes as three times three times three, or 27. And bones that are only nine times stronger won't be able to support an animal that's 27 times more massive. That's why an elephant can't look like a large gazelle. It has leg bones, for example, that are much thicker. Do you suppose Hollywood understands that? Well, so here we are at the center of the cosmic Ouroboros, and the size scales that make up our conscious world is the section that's shown here in sunlight. It includes everything from the littlest creatures that people have been able to see with the naked eye from possibly the size of a flea up to perhaps the size of the sun. And in our book, we decided to name this range of size scales, and we call it Midgard, which is a name that we borrowed from the Norse mythology of the Eddas. Midgard is what most people think of as reality. But as you can see, it's not all of reality. Reality is all of this. But Midgard is a special place. It's our mental homeland in the universe. It's our home sweet home. Now, Midgard is everywhere in the universe. It's not a place. It's a setting of the intellectual zoom lens, so to speak. So if you were on a planet in a distant galaxy a billion light years away, trying to get around on that planet, your Midgard intuition would be very useful, although of course it would be fallible. But if you just stay in this room and try to intuit how the universe works on these very large or very small size scales, uh, you discover that intuition is worthless. Without science, no one can and no one ever did figure out or even imagine accurately how the universe began or how it works on the very large or very small size scales. It's time to sum up. We've presented three new symbols to help communicate how we fit in to the new scientific picture. The cosmic spheres of time show that we live at the center of the visible universe. The finite speed of light makes that inevitable. We're made of the rarest stuff in the universe, heavy elements, stardust. We live at the middle of all possible sizes, where the possibility of tremendous variety and complexity coming in relatively small packages, our size, keeps life interesting. Life of our complexity could bloom nowhere else on the cosmic Ouroboros. People need a way to wrap their minds around a big picture for our time. Unlike virtually every earlier culture, 
in human history and probably also in prehistory, we in the West have no shared understanding of our common origins. We have libraries full of creation stories and a culture of skepticism. Without a believable story that explains the high-tech, fast-paced, and dangerous world that we live in, there's no way to conceptualize the big picture, and so there's no way to see it. Without a big picture, we're very small people. Cosmic perspective is partly a matter of knowledge, and it's partly a choice of outlook. Scientific cosmology doesn't directly tell anybody anything about how humans should behave. All it tells us is how the universe works. But the choice that we have is whether to see scientific cosmology as something that's intellectually rigorous but not personally relevant, or to take it seriously as an accurate map of reality, all of reality, including our lives and our decisions, at least to the extent that we understand its implications for those things. Romantics are made of stardust, but cynics are made of the nuclear waste of dead stars. Now, neither of these views is inaccurate scientifically, but they have tremendously different implications for how people feel and act. Why fight to save humanity if deep down you think that we're nothing but nuclear waste? A meaningful science-based cosmology could turn out to be the practical knowledge that lets us make sense for the first time of both the threats and the opportunities of what the president-elect in that speech called this defining moment. No one can predict what the country's going to be like or the world when Malia and Sasha are old, but we all have the obligation to consider the likely impacts of our own current decisions at least out to the Malia-Sasha horizon. Protection of the United States on that scale means above all protecting the conditions on which a decent life depends. A healthy ecosystem, a hopeful and energetic population, good relations with the world, and stable political institutions that keep upholding the Constitution and the principles on which our country is based. Envisioning the Malia-Sasha horizon when we make important decisions is just a beginning. The new cosmological picture can take us far beyond, both in time and in size scale. It gives us a scientifically grounded cosmic identity. We humans and our planet are stardust, evolving into awesome complexity over billions of years in an expanding universe shaped by dark matter and dark energy. Our primary identi identity is this, that we are human. Our primary need is a good planet, and no narrower association, whether it be country, religion, or family, is as deep. Each of us is connected to a multi-billion year history. We need to start thinking of our legacy on a comparable scale, a legacy that's worthy of our distant descendants, not only protecting the environment on Earth, important as this is, but laying the foundations for a wise and just global civilization. This will be a prerequisite for the kind of commitment required to achieve stable, sustainable prosperity and possibly to enable our, our descendants to move out into the galaxy. A new cosmology has the power to overturn the fundamental institutions of society. This is in fact what happened in the last cosmological revolution on the scale of the present one. When the Copernican Newtonian cosmology overthrew the medieval cosmology of the heavenly spheres. That revolution undercut the rigid social and religious hierarchies of medieval society that had been justified by their picture of the heavens. And soon the divine right of kings was challenged and the kings of England and France lost not only their thrones, but their heads. This is the kind of practical consequences that can result from a change in cosmology. Over the coming years, many more people may begin to recognize that if we want to protect ourselves and the rest of humanity, we have to open our minds at least to the possibility of an overarching, unifying cosmological vision for Earth that can help us humans with all our small divisions and our big emotions to cooperate for the long-term survival of our astonishing species. 
This vision would not impose a single way of thinking on everyone's lives. Humans are endlessly diverse, and this is our great strength. But as the cosmic Ouroboros shows, on different size scales, different laws control events. And what this suggests is that we can preserve diversity on the scale of humanity's local lifestyles while finding consensus on the nature of the planet and the universe, and in that consensus, some solid common ground. If we wake up to the reality of our universe and our current predicament on Earth, if we become willing to expand our interpretations of our religious and other traditions to encompass this new knowledge, if we begin to teach this new picture of the universe to our children and integrate its principles wherever appropriate into our thinking and into our art, then we could have a new enlightenment and we could become ancestors worthy of honor a thousand years from now. We're at the center of a vast cosmic adventure. We're not outside it and not at its end. So think cosmically, act globally, eat locally. Thank you very much. <laughs>